still every morning said good morning and had a time to play with the kids, watch them growing, feeding them, teaching them to walk, watching them smile for the first time, you know, and then going to say good night to them and uh, their cheeky smiles and her and her sister cuddling up and it was really epic. <laughs> Good morning. Johanna. Uli. Uli. Christina. Uno chai, uno chai. Uno chai. Uno chai. Daniel. That's a boy. Mambo. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's me. That's a boy. <laughs> so, lots of you. Hello. Hello. Lots of you keep asking how Christina is. Esda. Esda. It's so happy. And I haven't done a video on Christina, but she is doing great. Uh, but she's not as improved as her sister. <laughs> but she's very observant and she's starting to communicate a little bit. Aren't you? Yeah. But we'll get there with her. Lots of books. books. Okay. Good night, dummy. Good night. Good night. Takili. Takili. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, good bless. Light off? Yeah. As for me and my house, we'll serve you, Lord. I have a very good relationship with death, whereas I understand the basis of it. I don't have any confusion as to why we need death. It makes sense to me, you know, if you were to live infinite years or millions, billions of years, how long before the meaningfulness of your relationships with your children and your wife and your, your, your husband or whomever, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, you know, siblings, how long before it would lose meaning and become a little sterile after a million years of visiting the same people, talking, you'd just be, oh, you know what, what would, you go to see them and it, it wouldn't be as vibrant. And if you knew that they weren't going to die, you might not even bother with going to see them because it would get to that point of, of being sterile. And I get that about life and we're taught that in nature teaches us that and God did that on purpose. We have the seasons, we know that things die and they come back. We know we have our winter and our spring, you know, and we have those autumn seasons where things start to fade. Well, at least if there's an autumn season and something starts to fade, you get some, sometimes in life that's true, you get some forewarning that something's about to happen, that death is upon you, basically. And death doesn't have to be bad, it can be renewal, you know, the same as fire can be destructive, but also at the same time some plants only regerminate due to fire. So you have this balance in nature which is very profound and for me the problem I've had here, Fritzi pointed this out to me, is it was always in quick succession, I never had chance to take my foot off the gas and process any of it. So you'd have a dog die, which if you're a dog lover like me, it hurts like hell, it does, it's just it's agony. And even in the last eight weeks, as a prime example, I had Rumpel and Bruno die, my two big security dogs from Feather's Tail. And we've seen a lot together, if you watch my first vlog, uh, second vlog is where I pick up John Hickey. For the second ever YouTube video I did, I pick up John Hickey. And in there, all the dogs you see, Aside from Egypt and John Icky, 
and Simba have all since passed. I think all, yeah, they've all passed. So when I watch that, it 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 troubles me. I don't believe that I won't see them again, but I I know that they are. I'm not going to experience them as John in this realm again. I'm not going to be able to hold them and go for a run with Bruno or have Bruno fend people off me who were causing me trouble whilst I was out running etc back in the early years and that is just painful for all of us because we long to have those happy times again but when you don't process it and you just accept it's happened and move on <clears throat> It doesn't necessarily go where it needs to and it creates a heaviness, a tenseness in your body. And in the last eight weeks alone, Bruno and Rumpel, Cecilia and Christina, so two dogs very dear to me, died. And two children very dear to me died. And I'll admittedly say that Cecilia didn't bother me as much because she was quite sick and always in pain. And it was almost like you had to determine whether it was merciful that she passed because she was always breaking her bones and crying, bless her. But with Christina, she was always happy. And I raised Christina in the early time with Feather's Tail as her father. I was literally running a family unit back then. Still, every morning said good morning and had a time to play with the kids, watch them growing, feeding them, teaching them to walk, watching them smile for the first time, you know, and then going to say goodnight to them and their, their cheeky smiles and her and her sister cuddling up and... It was really epic. And during that time, there was more of a closeness with me and those children because of the way it was set up. And another child that was there was Johanna and... For three and four years, I was an adopted parent. I was a, a, a foster parent, a guardian. And I've got a biological son and the love is not so different. The love's really not so different. And when you're so busy trying to keep everybody else fed and clothed and they just go, they just, they just pass away. Both from uh, chest problems, pneumonias and chest issues, the most common cause of death and cerebral palsy. So we had a, a few autumns with them both, a few warnings, you know. But like, look at the last eight weeks, all that happens, and I'm sick and trying to process that I'm sick. And that's been happening for years here, and uh, it's took its toll on me internally. I've got a few knots in there that need untying. Because everybody needs time to grieve, and I woke up in the middle of the night the other night and uh, my heart was just aching and I was just started sobbing without much reason just purely because I knew I wasn't going to see these children again and it hit me like weeks later and I couldn't stop it, it, it was horrific and I thought well you've needed that from the beginning but I always held on and wanted to be strong for everybody else which I think a man of a house should be you call me sexist traditional whatever I don't know but I think there is a duty for a father to be strong because you can choose what you feel you know you don't want to be emotionally weaker than your children, I would say, personally. You, you should always be a, a source of strength for them to draw from, is my belief. I might be wrong, but my belief. And, uh,
I'll say I stick to that belief, but I think I handled it wrongly, and now I've become, I mean, physically quite unwell. But my only problem, as I keep saying to Fritzi, is I need to get rid of this bacteria from my body, because everything else will follow suit. But I think my immune system being down is part of all these knots in me. And I'm working on undoing them. Because there's just been no time to stop. You know, it's been five years being absolutely insane here. Insane. More than five years, actually. <laughs> Six years. But I think just the fact that I'm losing all my tools to deal with it, as in I can't go for a run to elevate my mood, you know, I can't do yoga because I run out of energy, it's all just sitting so much harder on me than what I ever thought it, it, it could. And in a way, I think God's training me. I mean, I, I know, I know that when I get out the other end of this, I'm going to be way stronger. And if I'm stronger now than what I was when this journey began, then I know I can build something far better for the children than what's already been built, something far superior something far more beneficial for Tanzania and its people when it comes to the care of the children, education for the children and the employment as well and focused more around my original message which was always that sharing is the solution and I want to make a short video about that because I wanted to while I've got a bit of brain space today um, so I will after this but I I almost feel like everything's been stripped away and left me bare, you know, I'm just naked in front of God and all I've got is my heart and my mind and no tricks, there's no running to up your endorphins, there's none of that, you know, there's, there's sit here and process it, deal with it, don't bury it, don't hide it because there's probably so much more to come that if you keep burying it and hiding it, you won't survive, you won't go the distance. And I feel like that's part of why I'm in this position. Because there's no other way you could have got me to sit still and just face it. I'd have been out running if I had my body. Running until my legs fell off like I used to, or until I got clear of how I felt if I was feeling pain until I could process some of the emotions a bit better but it would have been a form of masking whereas this is just gloves off alone with your inner grief, your inner stresses and the only thing you've got to navigate is your brain power in your heart I'm grateful almost that I'm in that position so. I don't think much else would have been able to get me there so that's the other side of my journey with healing is internal what's well, going really well must be or I wouldn't sit up in the middle of the night and start weeping for all of these for all my family that I won't see again I'll leave you with a picture of Christina and Johanna, I think. It's my favourite photo. Death's not a bad thing. But grief is real. And if grief wants to express itself, then you don't let it. You're going to get weak. And I wrote about this recently in the community section on YouTube. I didn't let the feelings come and it weakened me, physically weakened me, is my belief. So, time to fix that. Love you all.